This podcast is brought to you by the Northern Lights Council of the Boy Scouts of America. Cub Scouts is the nation's foremost youth program for character development and values-based leadership training. In the future, scouting will continue to offer young people responsible fun and adventure, instill in young people lifetime values, and develop in them ethical character, train young people in citizenship, service, and leadership, and serve America's communities and families with its quality, values-based program. Learn more at nlcbsa.org. Hi, everybody. I'm Chad Cool. Welcome to another edition of the Northland Outdoors podcast. And boy, these little discussions we've been having just keep getting better and better. And today is absolutely no different. I've got a guy here who in the last four years has essentially taken the walleye fishing world and turned it on its head. Talking about Wolverton professional angler Tom Wynn, who grew up as a son of a cattle rancher in Arkansas, Bought his first boat less than 10 years ago, and all of a sudden now is probably the hottest walleye fisherman in the world, including the 2024 National Walleye Tour champion. It's going to be a great rags to riches discussion with Tom Wynn, so don't go anywhere. But before we get to that, quick reminder, make sure you get over to inforum.com and subscribe. You don't want to miss a minute of the Northland Outdoors podcast or any of the other great information that that's out there, videos and the like. Also, uh, give us a five-star rating, if you would, on wherever you're listening to your podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts or the like. Um, those ratings really help drive us up the uh, up the charts there, and uh, we greatly appreciate it if you'd give us a nice rating there. And make sure you check your local listings, and don't miss an episode of Northland Outdoors Television on the WDAY ABC Network. Now, without further ado, let's talk walleye fishing with probably the hottest guy in the business right now, Wolverton professional angler, Tom Wynn. Well, this guy right here, I'm telling you, and I, I just got done telling him, I, he's, he's one of my favorite anglers of all time, because anybody that can take the, the, the stodgy world of walleye fishing, and I mean that with all respect, because I love it, but and turn it on its ear in about four years' time, gets my respect, and do things his own way. Tom Wynn, uh, 2024 National Walleye Tour champion, that happened just a couple weeks ago. Thank you so much for joining us on the Northland Outdoors podcast. I appreciate you having me. It means a lot. Thank you. So let's start with an easy one. How does yeah. the son of an Arkansas cattle rancher <laughs> in about four years time or less than 10 years from buying his first boat become quite possibly the hottest walleye fisherman in the world right now? That's an easy one. No. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, uh, it, it, it was, it's just, uh, things are just, meant to happen for a reason and i at the time and that's why i think like if something happens you know talking to some young anglers and stuff i'm talking high school junior high like if there's something that you want to do out there um you know something you have a passion for work for it and do it achieve it and you know as far as being the grandson of a small cattle farmer in arkansas like you know, what I took from that is appreciate everything, you know, like we didn't have money for much at all. Um, the cattle, when you hear cattle farmer, people sometimes think, oh, wow, that, you know, no, it, it wasn't, you know, it was just enough to make ends meet, you know, pay the bills for my grand, uh, my grandparents and my mom and dad. But, you know, it was, uh, I guess what I got from that was, the work ethic and literally to appreciate everything you do have and not to dwell on the things you don't. And if you do want something, you got to work for it. And mm -hmm. so like, yeah, like I said, I, I didn't set foot into a boat until I was in my thirties. And, mm -hmm. and the first boat I set foot into is the one I bought. And um, so that that's part of like, I, that's something I wanted, something I wanted to work for because I did have a passion for fishing growing up. And that was strangely developed just on the pond bank, you know, a muddy pond bank down in Arkansas, catching catfish and small largemouth and uh, bluegill. But it was uh, just things are just, you know, meant to happen and came up here for college uh, to Minnesota. And 
uh, was able to, you know, start a career and something completely unrelated to my uh, college <laughs> degree. I, you know, have fingernail salons and right. in Fargo and still do, but you know, just that, that fishing passion was always just, just always there. Even though I went, I, I literally went, I see, I'd say 10, eight to 10 years um, without even fishing any, because I, I was working right out of college. I was working 60, 70 hours a week in my businesses. Um, didn't have a boat, didn't own any rods and reels. All my stuff was still at home in Arkansas. And those were my little spin cast stuff. You know what I mean? Yep, like yep. Code 33s. And so it, it just, and I told myself, if I'm going to try a tournament, I'm going to do it when I'm ready and I'm going to do it meaning ready. I meant I was going to be ready to compete. And I was going to be ready. If I was going to compete, I'm going to do everything that I can to utilize everything in front of me to, um, to make a go at it. And yeah. I just happened to be in 2019, um, getting Garmin electronics for the first time outfitting the boat with at the time what people were saying was the best and i just utilized it and at the time i didn't realize that i was probably one of the first ones if not the first one to use it in the bass world or wildlife world actually um i I thought it was available why me like what what makes i i just assumed all these pros everybody would have it but i got it i spent so much money on it i was like you know what i i'm gonna learn how to do this because you know how many fingernails it takes to buy (laughs) <laughs> a boat and electronics. So uh, I learned how to use it, and uh, yeah, it's been a crazy, crazy road so far. Well, but I think you know, in looking at your story and watching you uh, in the last few years, um, I think one of the advantages you have is that you didn't know anything, That's right? It. I mean, we talk about it's a cliche to say, oh, don't fish memories and stuff like that. Or or, uh, you know, throwing the rules out the door. Well, you didn't even know the rules. So you got this stuff and went out and just fished and 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 this, you know, using this stuff that other guys are going, ah, you know, I don't want to I got to troll my spinners or my crankbaits because that's what I do. But that wasn't you. And you think that's the case that you were just kind of started with a clean slate? One hundred percent. It is because. I didn't know anything. I didn't have anybody who would give me any, any information like at bait shops and um, boat ramps, thing like that. Whenever I would go anywhere to uh, ask for information, it was always, um, you know, they, it was always the same thing, literally the same thing. Go find the weed edge in right. 14 to 15 feet of water and uh Dragon Lindy rig. It was always the same exact thing, no matter what area of Minnesota I'd go try to fish. It was always the same, same thing. And then I was like, you know what? That's just not me. I, I, I've watched these bass tournaments on live streaming now, like Bassmaster Live and stuff. I see these guys. They don't catch many walleyes, but when they do, they're giants. And right. so that was always in my head right away. Using bass tactics in coordination with forward-facing sonar to target big fish. And then when I could see that I was actually onto something, that's when my buddy Nate and I decided to jump in that first uh, AIM team tournament on Leech Lake. And um, I'm glad we did. We And we didn't, we never caught that many fish all through mine and Nate's AIM career for three years. We didn't ever catch that many fish in tournaments, but in a tournament, that's what it's all about. You're the only hunt, hunting giants. So, yeah. Yeah. And so just, you're right. Not knowing anything really helped me to go do what I'm doing now. And then now to be kind of on the forefront of that and seeing now that at the time there was one team out there standing on the bow of their boat. Now. Everybody. Everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) <laughs> By the way, folks, in uh, entering that tournament on a whim in, in 19 on Leech Lake, his first professional tournament, they won, by the way, mm-hmm. and which is which doesn't happen. I'm here to tell <laughs> no. you. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen. So and and they've repeated they repeated that a number of times. And then uh, um, Tom has had a great solo career as well in the National Walleye Tour. Um, and then, of course, just a couple of weeks ago, you won the 
uh, National Walleye Tour Championship for this year on what appeared to me to be one of the toughest bites that field has faced in a long time. And out of that, um, I'm not sure, I, I, I didn't look close enough to see if you were the only one, but you were one of the only guys that had an increased weight every day, if not the only one, including the biggest bag on the last day. So Mm -hmm. how do you do that on a bite? Like, so you're on Lake Huron, which is an ocean. Um, I worked in Alpena, Michigan. I know exactly where, where (laughs) you were there. That's big, big water with a Mm -hmm. lot of wind. Um, Sitting on the bow is not easy. So take us a little bit through that, this last tournament and how you won that. Yeah. So, I mean, in practice there, I, I'm learning a lot now about the Great Lakes. Um, A couple years ago, my buddy Nate and I uh, fished Lake Erie and we just went fishing and we caught fish, but we just went fishing. We didn't realize on the Great Lakes at, you know, that you have to look for certain water colors. You have to look for more importantly, different water temperatures. Um, these water temps, these currents are moving these pockets of warm air all around the lake. And the wind is a big factor in that as well. And like you said, I mean, Lake Huron is massive. It looks like the ocean and that wind is brutal. Like it, there was like, and I think two or three of our practice days were small craft advisories um, mm-hmm. from the Coast Guard. And, but we had to go out, f- figure, you know, try to figure something out in that. And the only thing I could figure out in, in that was there's fish there one day or maybe two hours ago in this area and then they're gone. And that's directly correlated to water temps. That's how fast those water temps move. Like there is an area up there in like 18 feet of water where one day um, we found some decent fish. And then the very next day went out and that water temp in the same spot, the air temp was the same, but the water temp was almost 10 degrees colder. So Mm -hmm. That and then it was just barren, no fish there to mark on your electronics whatsoever. Um, and so I in Alpena is where a lot of the people ran to from Oscada uh, for the tournament because traditionally that's where the biggest fish are that time of year. And so there I was in practice, I went the, the equal distance 35 40 miles south of that. Oh. Mm. to check it out down in that uh, uh, Pisconing, Pisconing River area or something. I can't, I don't even remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could be totally wrong on that name, but somewhere down south there, Saginaw Bay. And the first day I was down there, the first thing I noticed was, this is in practice, I noticed the watercolor was dirtier. Um, only a couple feet clarity, which I love that. Whereas up in Alpena, the watercolor is so clear that you can see the bottom in 25 to 30 feet of water. It's, mm. it's insane. So I like that dirtier water. So what I noticed up there right away is way, I was seeing way more fish uh, down south. Now I spent an entire day down there in practice and caught some three pounders, three and a half pounders. So, but that was it. Um, the entirety of practice, I caught two over four pounds and they they just went like four, four and a quarter pounds. And the, all of practice. And I was telling people too, I'm like, this is, this practice is it, the smallest fish I've caught all year in practice <laughs> at going into a tournament. And everybody was saying that you're going to need 20 to 25 pounds to make the cut and 25 to 30 to win the tournament. And, you know, that's always in somebody's mind during the, all that doc talk session and previews for the tournament. And I w- spent every day out there in practice like deep in detail doing what I do spent so many hours out there and all I was getting all like I knew I could get consistently was possibly between 16 and 18 pounds. So that's what I went with. That's what I had to just tell myself, look, you're pretty good at this. If you're seeing that, then maybe that's what you need to shoot for and don't stress out about trying to get 20 some pounds. So um, and in my pre-tournament interview, I said the same thing. So I made the decision while most of the field on day one ran north, I ran the equal distance, but I ran south. And I think I was 10 to 12 miles more south than the next closest competitor, actually. Mm-hmm. And 
Um, so I get down there, the water temp is stable. The whole week, the water temperature down there was between, you know, 68, 69 degrees. It never moved down there. And that's a lot to do with the water clarity as well. That stained water stays warmer, longer. Sure. And um, so I went down there. Let's back up one second, though. But whenever I went on that pre-fishing, when I was pre-fishing up by Alpena one day, uh, we, I, the pot of warm water, the big, you know, section of warm water moved offshore. Mm -hmm. And so that warm water was actually not on shore anymore. It was sitting in over like 80 to 120 feet of water. And the, that's where the walleyes were. They were sitting out there suspended 20, 30, 40, 50 feet down over that super, super deep water. And, um, I could see a lot of people found that pattern and I was thinking, okay, this is my style. I can do this. I can find these marks, but what I noticed about those fish were, and it could be um, complete uh, coincidence, but all these fish were moving fast, um, and they were and fast meaning a mile to two miles an hour, and they sure. were moving and they were moving south. Because when well, I was huh? stay with them, they were moving south. So I'm like, that's seventy to eighty miles to where I found that my spot I fish in practice. So I'm thinking, well, in a few days during the tournament, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like Friday, Saturday. It was a yeah. fairy tale to think it, you know what I mean? But like, like, yeah, right. It can't, you can't write a story that cleanly. But I um, went down for day one of the tournament. I went down there. At first, coming out of that shoot, I was like, do I turn left? Do I turn right? I went right just to follow my gut. I went down south. I did catch exactly because I was, I was saying 16 to 18 pounds. Day one, I caught exactly 18. 16 pounds on the dot. Yeah. Day two, I caught 18, 14, somewhere in there, in high 18-pound yeah. range. So I was like right exactly hey. where I thought to put me in the top 10. And that was my strategy going in is to be in the top 10 because I wanted a shot at Angler of the Year. And right. my my thought was if I can crack that top 10, be consistent, and then maybe one of the, the other two guys, uh, Dylan and uh, Hunter, if mm -hmm. they would stumble and not make the top 10, that was my chance to maybe take over. But no, they both <laughs> made the top 10. So going into day three, I'm like, <laughs> I have to win this thing. And Hunter's got to get ninth. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. and I have to still come in ahead of Dylan. So that's what I was saying. Like I have to, uh, you know, and crazy thing is that's exactly what ended up happening. So right. Tied, but then he won the tiebreaker, which – you know, it was awesome for him. He had a really, really good season. Uh, but that day two of the tournament at around noon, I noticed the, I was seeing way more bait, which is smelt up there is the primary forage on my electronics, on my live scope. I was seeing way more bait start to move in and these bigger marks just start to swim, swim through down there over that 28 to 32 feet of water. And I told my call angler on day two, uh, I was like, I, I, Think we're witnessing something right now i think we're witnessing the head of the migration of these fish following warm water and bait to warm water because it's getting colder up north and um at the weigh in on day two we're all you know waiting for everybody to weigh in and i tell a few of the guys there i'm like i think and i'm i'll tell everybody everything like i'm not one of the, like, right. <laughs> i'm like yeah i'm down south and i'm you know, um, I think I'm witnessing something t today and if that holds tomorrow, it could be, it could be a special day. And by, uh, 1035, my co-angler told me last night, actually, he looked at his watch when we had 24 pounds in the boat, it was 1035 <laughs> that morning. Uh, and, uh, it was, it, it was just exactly happened exactly the way that I was, not anticipating, but thinking was possible, if that makes sense. Yeah, like yeah. I thought it was possible and it just happened to work out. And we came in 40 minutes early to avoid any more dead fish penalty. Cause I did have one dead fish, but, um, came in early and still, uh, was able to pull it out. Yeah. It, was, it was awesome. Well, here's another one where whether you tried to or not, you kind of, with that whole, strategy you just explained kind of went against the grain with with most tournament walleye guys who want to find the fish and then stay on the fish or follow the fish right that's 
that's the uh, kind of the rule. But a lot of times, by the time you decide that they've moved and pulled up, then you know you're behind already. Whereas you you got ahead of them and and, and let, yeah. let them come to you. you exactly. Know? So that was the thing is like they you, exactly. So then you might have them the, the the afternoon before, but then that night before the tournament, they they move and. Right. It's like I was fishing. I wasn't fishing where the fish were. I was fishing where they were going, and um, that made that made a huge difference. What drew you to walleyes? Just living in Minnesota at the time, or I mean, you didn't grow up in the walleye hotbed of the world. Although there's some good walleye fishing in Arkansas, but the, not exactly. You know, that's not your first choice, as most guys down there. Uh, what drew you to this species? Um, just. Uh, coincidence like i fished some bass tournaments at the year i got my boat i jumped into some b- big bass tournaments and uh that was my species of choice up in minnesota right away for those first few years um i still like bass fishing just don't got time to do it anymore and the covid hit and with my i have polished nail spa salons in fargo Ooh. and Ooh. during covid obviously we got shut down for uh couple months um and uh, you know it was a little bit scary during that time but i had already got my boat i already got these electronics and i'm like well here's my chance right now to use them go practice them i guess during this downtime and also during that downtime it rescheduled covid had my 2020 schedule on bass all you know messed up like when it got rescheduled it got it was too tight. So I couldn't make that run across the country and be gone from home and the salons for a couple months at a time. It was just well, not doable. So I pulled out of those bass tournaments and um, I was staying up at a campground up on Leech Lake and my uh, n- next door neighbor at the campground, what, you know, Nate Wolski, uh, and right. literally just, just met him. And um, I, within a week, first week of meeting him, I'm like, you want to fish this tournament that's coming to Leech Lake? And, <laughs> and I literally just heard about the tournament on, on the dock from, from <laughs> people, other people on the dock saying, Hey, there's this tournament coming. And they thought it was a bass tournament. So I looked um. it up and I laying in bed. I'm like, I Googled Leech Lake professional bass tournament, 2020. And it, uh, obviously nothing popped up. It was a aim walleye tournament. Walleye t- <laughs> And so and I just passed that off. I'm like, I'm not going to fish a walleye tournament. Like, yeah, I don't know anything about it. And then I started thinking about it and then talking to Nate. I'm like, why not? Let's just try it, you know? Uh-huh. And so I still have my bass boat. Um, call the oh, tournament. That's awesome. Call the tournament director. Usually, as you probably know, Le- the AIM Minnesota on Leech Lake usually is pretty full. Yeah. Full, so they can only take yeah. 100 when, when I called to see, I didn't know that. I'm like, hey, I, I want to enter this, just thinking I could just enter it. And the tournament director was like, you know what? Just yesterday, a couple of gentlemen withdrew because of COVID, so there is a spot. I'm like, I'll take it. So <laughs> looking back now, it's like, literally, if if that never would have happened. Yeah, who knows? I never would have fished that Leech Lake tournament. I would still today probably have never fished a walleye tournament. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. It's crazy how things work. And then, so I just kept following that path and, um, you know, when Nate and I just kept going and I kept telling Nate, I'm like, cause he never fished a tournament before. I'm like, don't get used to this. This doesn't yeah. happen. And then it just yeah, but kept it did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, hey, but don't kid yourself, folks. He's still a bass fisherman at heart. They won a tournament on the Mississippi River, of all things, I heard, flipping craw baits, right? I mean, you know, for walleye, flipping craw baits on wing dams or something like that and catching walleye. So, yeah. Yeah, there are no rules, people. And and Tom is the is the is the perfect example of that. The rules are what you make them. And Mm -hmm. and and these fish all eat. And one of the and they eat. When they're hungry, they eat lots of different stuff, not just yeah. leeches, night crawlers, and minnows, okay, or crankbaits. Uh, and one of the things that's really helped, and I know this is key for you, that's really helped teach us that, and I keep learning all the time, is forward-facing sonar. And it's such a controversial kind of topic now, especially among tournament guys. 
Um, there's a couple of uh, series now that have come out, and one is restricting it none next year, one of the big tournament, national tournament series. Uh, Bassmaster just came out with some different rules. One um, transducer on your boat is all you're allowed. I get it. It's really amazing technology. But for me, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts, for me what it has done is, yeah, it, it does help you catch fish, but what it has done is taught me so much about how fish live and react and do the stuff they do. Yep. You know, walleyes are supposed to be within a foot of the bottom all the time, right? That's what we grew up. Well, you didn't grow up learning. That's what we grew up learning as school people. And now yep. I'm out in 30 feet of water and they're 10 feet down in the middle of the day with bright sun, you yep. know? Um, you tell don't me about, have, you don't have to have walleye chop. <laughs> no, you don't. So tell me about live yeah. scope. Tell me about yeah, forward facing so, sonar. So you're talking about the, you know, people who are against it, that is controversial and stuff and what i'm learning is like in the beginning of me doing this and dialing in forward facing sonar back in 2021 um there are some really close people to me that are really good at forward facing sonar now that at the time were against it and the reasoning is is because they they had it they bought it because they thought they heard that it was the latest greatest thing they installed it on their boats, maybe dropped it in the water one or two times, but then either got intimidated because of the technology or they weren't seeing. Here's the problem. YouTube, for example, you can go out there and you can you can search how to use live scope, how to use forward facing sonar. And what you're going to see on YouTube is a compilation of people catching fish and just showing you the success that's all they show they show the success they show them hooking these fish they show them on the electronics they're not showing you all of the downtime all of the time that you're looking scanning not seeing fish the hours of not seeing fish even though you have live scope so people get the technology put the trolling motor into the water and then they're not seeing what they think they should be seeing so they're like oh well my settings are wrong so they go in there, they overwork their settings all the time. They they make it where, like, if I was even to get into their boat, it would be unusable to me because of the settings they're using. And they just get disgruntled with it and put it away. But then they see other people having success with it. So they're like, well, then, you know, I'm going to be against it. It's going right, to ruin right. our fisheries. It's not fair to tournament anglers. But... You said like Bassmaster and the Bass Circuits. So Bassmaster limited it to one one transducer, and I'm fine with that. Like, yeah, I was probably one of the first ones to put two transducers on my trolling motor for the last three years. I probably was the first to do that. This last year, though, this entire 2024, I wanted to prove something and show people that adding more transducers doesn't make you better. So all year long, I just ran with one. one. All year long, I ran with one transducer just to see if I could show people that you have to get good with one because two doesn't just automatically make you better. There's people have four or five. Have four or five. And, so, and as far as people being against it because it's going to ruin our fisheries, um, I've obviously been doing this for a few years now very efficiently and um, yes, I'm confident that I can go catch a walleye in most lakes, like in Minnesota, for example, for my, on my first time, but it's never a guarantee. And if I do, I'm keeping way less fish now yeah. than I did before because we kept them before because, okay, we're like, let's just say we go out and had a good day Lindy rigging or trolling, right? We had really good day fishing, which I never did, but there really, there's, there's good solid anglers out there who did. They'd have a day where they could take three people out. They'd all catch their limits. They kept all those fish because the next day they might get skunked. They might go out and catch two or three. So they're, right. they're keeping the fish, putting them in the freezer, which nothing wrong with that, but they're keeping them for later for fish fries for later in the season or through the winter. Whereas now we're not doing that. Like we want to go have a fish fry. We go catch our limit, throw the rest back that we're not going to eat. And that's it. We, we yep. have our bill. <laughs> and so yep. we're, we're throwing so many more fish back. We can, and, and one other thing too, real quick with forward facing sonar, like I get this a lot now because like you said, over 30 feet of water, we're catching some of these fish and some of them happen to be big. 
all the time on my social media. Actually, not so much on mine, but on some of my good friends' social media, um, that people will comment, "Oh, you're catching those giants over thirty feet of water, killing killing those big fish." You know, mm-hmm. you're just wrecking it. No, here's the thing. Now, I get it where you pull a fish out of big water. You know, the air bladder expands, it puts pressure on their heart, so they have a hard time breathing. But here's the thing. The reason we were killing so many fish like that before is because we were dragging that Lindy rig. We were trolling. We were doing all this. We reel them up, right? When we're reeling them up fast because it's a big fish. It's a giant. Our eyes want to see it. That's our brains. Like, I want to see this fish. So we're reeling it up a little bit faster, bringing it up. The air bladder expands too much. Then they, they, we try to get them to go back down and they just won't. Um, and once we get that giant fish up, that 28 to 30 inch or up at that time, we're taking 30 pictures with it because yeah. it's one of the few giants we're catching. Now we're catching more, but we're faster with them. We're not even taking pictures of them anymore because they're like, Oh, I just caught a few today, but we're putting them right back. But here's the best part about forward facing sonar. Any, even in aim tournaments in the heat of the tournament, Nate and I, when we caught a big one, we'd put it back in the water and we would follow a forward facing sonar until it was comfortable sitting stagnant in the water, not moving. Yeah, you can see it. Down, they'll, they, yep. And then they'll sometimes they'll go down, then they start coming back up a little bit, then they come back down. And until they're like sitting there for at least two minutes, not moving, you know, we would just sit, sit, stay there and watch them. And so that's also how I know by treating them right, bring them up slowly, because guess what about what I said about people want to see them and they're reeling them up really fast. You lose them. Well, I've already seen that fish. You know what I mean? You're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't saw that it's a 28 to 30 inch or so I'm like, you know, I'm not in any hurry to get that thing in. So there's a lot of things that people aren't thinking about, but because, and the main thing is, is because they're not, up on it yet they're not as educated on it or as efficient with it to actually understand it and i i believe that i could take people who are t- completely against it and uh, may, just teach them if i could just right. teach them how to use it efficiently it would completely change their minds well there's a good segue launching today tom win university yeah. now you th- directly related to this subject right using this technology yeah using this technology and what it can do for you how to use it correctly and so on so how do people tell me about tom win university so it started the idea was a couple years ago now uh but with being one of the first to do it and people just questioning like what is he doing what is what him and nate looking at like how come we're not seeing what they're seeing or I, I get asked, Tom, can you actually see that one eighth ounce Northland tungsten jig when you cast it? And I'm like, yeah, every single time. I can see it go all the way to the bottom. Plus, I can see my 10 pound test braid tied to the leader all the way down to the bottom of the lake. And people are like, didn't believe me. So then I'm like, well, <laughs> and, and I, among so many other questions and through social media, I get so many questions I answer. I, I'm pretty happy to say I've answered probably 99% of them. And um, I started getting asked about on the water trips, like, hey, would you ever take me out to learn, to teach me what you know on port facing sonar? And I started thinking about that. Number one, I don't have the time for that. Um, number two is like, I would love to do that, but I would be taking your money and as soon as you stepped off my boat, you'd only remember a fraction of what you just saw because there was so much. Wow, right. and so, yeah. so by doing it this way and what Tom Wynn University is, it's web-based and it's on www.fishthu.com. And it's, um, it's a compilation of 170 some videos and video clips when these video clips aren't me catching fish what's crazy is i only have probably i don't even know if it's six clips in there of me actually catching a fish i don't that's it because i'm not in there to entertain 
I'm there to teach and then show you how different it is than a lot of these, that, like a lot of uh, content that you can get on YouTube or other avenues out there on the internet when it comes to education. This is a platform and it's curriculum based. So if some of you out there have taken online education through some top notch universities across the, the country, when you sign up for THU, it's going to look very familiar. Um, yeah. Yeah, the concept, the layout is specifically laid out perfectly for information retention. Like you, what, what the way it's laid out and the things that you're watching in a certain order is built specifically so that you can retain that in your mind. But the beauty is, even if you can't remember all those little things, because there's a lot of information that you will see and here in my university that you, it might, you, you might not remember when you get to your boat, but then you have your phone, yeah, Open pull, up it up. Your phone pull it up, log in and it's right there. And you don't have to sort through so much stuff to maybe find what you want. You just, you just kind of scroll around and you, it's indexed perfectly for people to find the exact topic they want to learn. I'm signing up right now. I got live scope on the boat this year. I'm loving it, but you can always learn more. And especially from a guy who's been as successful with it as this guy right here. What, in your opinion, based on all of this, I mean, you know, when the green box came out, that was going to end fishing when uh, flashers and when, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it can go, goes on and on, them, but it's not going to stop. Technology is what it is. So in your mind, what does the future of fishing look like to you right now? Um, the future, I think technology is just only going to progress. And, um, if anything, like I said, like as far as tournaments go, if they want to take away, uh, forward facing, restrict it to one fine, but restricting it entirely, um, the circuits that are doing that, I, in my thinking right now are just going to be temporary circuits, yeah. um, because, you know, and some people have said through social media, they've never said it to my face, but they're like, if you, you would never have done this well if it wasn't for forward facing sonar. And I'm like, so <laughs> like, yeah, I, right. I'm not going to make excuses. <laughs> yes, you're right. We got but, what difference does it well, make? <laughs> they're, they're also, they're like, well, the NWT is going to ban it. And this is just from, not from tournament anglers or anything like that. They're like, the NWT and stuff, tournaments are all going to ban it pretty soon. And I'm like, go ahead. Because then me and a lot of other guys will start another circuit. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right. So that's one thing people aren't thinking about either. But I have to say this. On the National Walleye Tour and just the walleye anglers in general up here in the north and Midwest, you don't hear it. Like you hear the the controversies in the bass world down south. You don't hear yeah. about it here like up here. There's not like a big cry for Benny. It's, it's impressive to see the legends of walleye fishing and the future legends. Like, you know, you got Gary Parsons, you got um, uh, Jason Shakir, uh, Corey Springle, uh, yeah. Jace Parsons. And so a lot of these guys are really good, solid anglers like Kent Anderson, you know, with mm -hmm. Corey yeah, Kent. So mm -hmm. look at him now jumping up on the front of the boat utilizing yeah. these electronics so they're embracing it and what i've said all along in the last two or three years what i've said to people all along is that i'm electronics based and successful at it but if you can take somebody who's traditionally good or superb at angling like the guys i just mentioned and teach them a fraction or a little bit of what i know of electronics it's going to be absolutely scary. Yeah. Like those guys yeah. are going to be unbelievable. And yeah, correct. This, this year I wanted to, uh, this is my first year teaming up with anybody on the NWT. I've ran solo this whole time until this year. And it was all based on like a decision to see if I was correct in all this. And I teamed up with Chase Parsons, Tommy Kemos and Corey Springle. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just those guys, you know. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, nobody. 
Yeah. But for them to have me was completely humbling as well. Like yeah, those guys cool. are absolutely amazing. But to, to prove that if you can combine, combine what they know already with what I've come in with, it could be nuts. And then Pretty deadly. And it, and it worked. So, yeah. <laughs> well, here, here, from a guy who hung around the tournament world a lot uh, for many, many years, they produced PWT shows. And then we did all of the FLW walleye series until that was gone. And um, one of the things the walleye guys always, uh, it, it was, you know, why can't we be as popular as bass? Why can't we be as popular as bass? Well, the reason is just nobody tunes in to watch a planer board go across the water. I hate to say it. Believe me, I love it. We yeah. caught, caught, we caught yeah. big fish. It's great. It's fun to figure yeah. out 15 back from 20, 10 down over whatever. Okay. <laughs> All of that stuff is cool. But as a, as an entertainment, as something that people might want to watch, it's just not there. Wow. Now sitting on the bow with a qu quarter ounce jig in your hand and plastics and, and sniping uh, fish that you can see, that's what bass is. That's what they do, right? And 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 that makes, in my opinion, walleye fishing that much more attractive for a wider audience. I think, anyway. And that's that's no, my that, humble that, opinion. Whatever it's worth. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a huge, huge part of it. And my takeaway on that. So I wasn't, I haven't been in the walleye circuit or fishing that long. But from stories I hear, at there was a time where walleye and bass was pretty much on equal footing like business wise you know they're equal popularity um and then bass just took a whole different marketing turn which probably was espn at the time and then yeah. but with all that bass master stuff and being with espn there's a lot of live right there's a lot of bass right. master live right. on the water so there's no secrets anymore right so it all of us at home could sit there and watch kvd and brandon palinuk and aaron martin's you know, win these tournaments and we could see exactly their cadence. We could see their baits. We could see everything. The Wally world's never had that. So we don't know what people are using and people have been so secretive in the Wally world Correct. and not yep. educating. So then this is also with THU, with Tom Wynn University. Like this is my goal. I'm in my forties. Like I'll be 45 very soon. And I'm not one of the young guys getting into this. I'm new to this, but I'm not one of the young guys. So it's like, I don't have time to like get better. Like some of these 20 year olds. So it's like, if I, I can somehow start the growth again for the walleye circuits, walleye industry, that'd be awesome. And then yeah. to inspire some of these young guys to just pick it up from there and take it, that would be, that would be amazing. Well, Tom, it's been really fun to watch you uh, the last few years and everything that you've done. And again, like I said, personally, I'm a fan because I love the way you do it. And it's 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 really fun to watch. Uh, best of luck with, with Tom Wynn University. Um, like I said, I'm serious. I'm going to log on as soon as we get done today. Um, you. Your future, obviously, you're still planning to keep plugging away next year. I know at one point you had flirted with maybe doing some bass, too. Um, is that still something you want to maybe pursue or not? There's nothing like the thought of walking across that Bassmaster Classic stage. And honestly, I think if I could take the time away to go back and fish the entire Bassmaster Open Circuit and to qualify for the elites and then to make that stage, I would try it, but I just don't think... I could be away from my businesses, my home. I don't right. think I could be away that long. And then plus right now, like where I'm at in the walleye industry, I don't want to leave a lot of the these people who are looking up to me for this education, for this stuff. I don't want to leave them behind in what they're learning. And, you know, in a lot of these education courses too, I show a lot of bass stuff and there's going to be way more bass stuff in the future that I'm going to show uh, with this education. But I, as of right now, I'd love to try that to shoot for that, but I not yet. It can't, it can't happen yet. Well, I think you're doing just fine right where you're at. By the way, if you want the best looking nails in Fargo Moorhead, make sure you check out what's the name of the, of the, of the salon. Polished nail spa. 
Polish nail spa. Will you do like custom large mouth or small mouth on my fingernails if I came in? Yeah, Could you? You got, got it. it. <laughs> we, 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 we have some fantastic nail artists that. Uh, <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> they could oh, I, no, I bet I wouldn't. I bet it's fantastic. No, Tom, thank you so much. And make sure uh, Facebook, Instagram, I'm assuming um, all the the normal places, just do a search for Tom and find him and follow him. Some of the content on there is great. I was perusing his Facebook site today. Lots of great stuff, videos. And then, of course, Tom Wayne University. Uh, it's been great chatting with you, finally, for the first time. And I look forward to chatting again soon. Tom, thanks so much. Time, man. Appreciate you having me. It really is an amazing story. Tom Wynn, thank you again so much for sharing your story with us and some great information on modern day walleye fishing and what it takes to succeed. Um, You could do a lot worse than to mimic Tom Wynn if you want to get out there and catch some walleyes or any fish for that matter. So thanks again, Tom. Before we go, a reminder, get over to inform.com and subscribe. Also, make sure you give Northland Outdoors podcast a five-star rating wherever you're getting your podcast. And check your local listings. And don't miss an episode of Northland Outdoors Television. Until next time, I'm Chad Cool. Thanks for tuning in to the Northland Outdoors Podcast.